friends. I just pressed the let's go live a button, which means we've got to wait for the stream to fire up all across the fruited plane of the internet. Before we go ahead and get started, got to make sure those tubes are working. You know, sometimes those tubes can be a little bit problematic, filled with feds in the tubes. But it looks like we are connected, which is tremendous news. That means we can go ahead and get started. So let's do it, shall we? Wait, 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 wait. Let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live, the show that spotlights misconduct involving police, prosecutors, and politicians. My name is Robert Govea. I am a criminal defense attorney. And today we're talking about Trump trials. I know it may feel like today was a light day, but we actually do have some serious business to attend to because they were in session in New York in the Letitia Tishy James prosecution taking place in Judge Angeron's courtroom. And Trump's defense filed a motion for a directed verdict. They were saying, Your Honor, the government has concluded their case. Tish has presented all of the evidence that only Tish can, and they have been found wanting. There's nothing there. And so, Your Honor, you have no choice but to grant us a directed verdict. Just say Trump is you know, not guilty, essentially, to use a criminal term, and eliminate this shenanigan from ongoing. And so they filed that. We are going to go through the transcripts from our friend Adam Klasfeld, he's over reporting for The Messenger, doing the X script. He was there in New York today, and so we'll see what he has to say about it. But Trump was on with this show called Clay and Buck Sexton, which we'll talk about. And he said that, you know, if the Democrats really had their way, they would put him in jail. And I don't disagree with him. I think that they might do more than that if they got their really wish. But we'll leave that aside. So he was on there saying they would put me in jail. And Chris Christie was out after a pretty poor debate performance where nobody remembers him. He came out and says, look, Trump will be convicted, all right? And we're going to take this thing and fight this thing all the way to the convention. And so we'll go into that and see what Chris Christie said about it all in the first segment so that we can get our bearing straight on sort of what the Republicans are doing and what's happening in New York. Then we're going to turn our attention over to what's happening on the January 6th case. We've got Judge Chetkin. We know that she issued a gag order for Donald Trump saying that his free speech was subordinated to her courtroom local criminal rules. And, well, you know, my due process in my court. And you're like, wait, why? What about his First Amendment rights? What about the First Amendment rights of tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of Americans to receive the messages from the president? And so Chutkin issued the gag order. Trump has appealed it. And previously on this channel, we have talked about the notice of appeal, the initial filings. But today we're going to go through the big opening brief, which is a whopping 67 pages. And woo, we love our meaty court documents here. And so uh, uh, appellate memos and uh, opening briefs and these things, sometimes they have a lot of legalese in there. And so we'll hit the highlights of that filing because this is something that might end up in front of the Supreme Court. So we got to be up to speed with what happens there. But Donald Trump also made a campaign stop. And he said, you know, when I win, the DOJ and all these people who are behind these weaponized prosecutions against me, they're in big trouble, buddy. And, you know, you can see why they want Trump gagged and they don't want him to be able to use his voice and have it reach a hundred plus million Americans and have them galvanized into supporting the cause. So they're going to try to gag him and stop him from talking about this illegitimate prosecution in the process of being illegitimate. And then finally... We are going to get into Hunter Biden's art dealer's new subpoena. Now, Hunter Biden, you may remember him from COVID mucus paintings that kind of look like this. In fact, this is one of his earlier versions. This is what he was doing before uh, somebody, you know, I don't know, he got trained or somebody started helping him or, you know, theoretically he got a ghost painter. In my opinion, maybe that happened. I don't know. But something happened and he is now, you know, selling his paintings for like a lot of money. And some people are wondering why that is, because we know that art can often be used for money laundering because it's very hard to value and people can just buy it for whatever and then sell it for whatever. And it's tax write offs and you put it in different safe harbors and we all know the deal. So. We're going to go through this. Yeah, it looks like kind of like COVID or something there, or like an STD from one of his romps. But this is what James Comer said. He's got, we're not done yet. Yesterday, we talked about Hunter got a subpoena. 
And we know James Biden got a subpoena and we know others got subpoenas and others got letters like Sarah Biden and Hallie Biden and others. But Comer said, we're not done yet, buddy boy. We got a lot more coming. And so the more subpoenas got dropped today and we'll talk through them. Eric Sherwin, business associate to the Biden crime family, Mervyn Yan, similar story. And then the art dealer, George S. Burgess. And then theoretically the art buyer, Elizabeth Neftali, who may have purchased one of Hunty's, uh, you know, mucus paintings. So then we'll take a look at what James Comer had to say about it because we know that the subpoenas got issued. But the question is, are they going to do anything? Are the subpoenas going to carry any weight? You know, is the Bi Biden, you know, crime family going to circle the wagons around Hunter and protect him against Congress? You know, the DOJ, the FBI, these executive agencies with executive functions, are they going to support him? We'll see. Comer explains that there's a pattern here and two other Congress people are saying, look, man, this is it. We're finally getting some good progress here and we're happy about it. So we'll check in with Representative Russell Fry. He's over from South Carolina. And then we've got Byron Donalds, who's going to say, hey, you know, Hunter, it's not a good idea to not comply with legislative subpoenas because we know what happened the last time some people didn't comply with legislative subpoenas. People like Steve Bannon got prosecuted. People like Peter Navarro are still being prosecuted. And so... We'll see if any of that happens. We'll also check in, see what the White House has to say about it with Kareen. Probably not going to be saying much because it's Kareen. If you have, um, I'm going to refer, if you have the word refer you to someone on your bingo card, probably a safe play. And so my friends, as you can see, we've got a lot to get to today. We are excited that you are here and joining us. It is a beautiful Thursday. Week is rocking and rolling. Can you believe it's the ninth already? Like what the heck, man? We got Thanksgiving in like two weeks which is going to be fun. And so we're going to get to a bunch of stuff today. This morning on our Membo only stream, we had a great stream. We were talking about the debate last night and really what happened with Vivek. He kind of came out and was throwing some elbows out there, you know, left and right. And it was a lot of fun. Played a lot of clips of that and did a full debate debrief with our members only community. And so we love having our members only morning streams. We love our Saturday shows. We love our after parties and debriefs after this show is over. And so we really try to deliver for our members and we got some other fun stuff we're cooking up. And so come and join us watching the watchers.locals.com for that extra content and to connect with a great community. We also, you can also join on the YouTubes and Tony Hay Munkets just gifted five new members into the YouTubes. And so for our YouTube friends who are joining us as members on YouTube, you get all the same stuff, everything I just described, except you just got to join Telegram for the live stream after party, which takes place off of the YouTubes. And so come and check us out either way. We also have our website, robertgovea.com. You can sign up for our daily newsletter. So if you miss one of the show segments, you can't stick around for the full thing and you want to get these show reports delivered to your inbox. Our team takes all of the segments we do here translates them into posts, includes all of the PDFs where applicable. And so you can come here to the website, get the latest on all the segments that we're talking about, and then read the reports, right? If you can't watch the full video, you can just get a quick summary of what was discussed in the video and get access to the PDFs if they're there. And uh, obviously we appreciate you signing up for our newsletter. That way we can always stay in touch. You just click, click here for instant access, sign up to the newsletter. You can also check us out on all the different audio platforms as well. So that's where we'd love to see you, robertcovea.com. All right, now, without any further ado, it's time to get into the show. Starting now, let's do it. Donald Trump warns saying they'd put me in jail if they had their way, and I don't doubt that for a minute. I think they'd do a lot worse if they could, but he's talking about the Democrats and the onslaught lawfare. We have a bunch of different criminal proceedings we're covering here. We also have the civil proceeding, which is borderline criminal. I mean, the sanctions that would be against Trump are so punitive. They're talking about taking away a quarter billion dollars away from him and taking away his property and his businesses out of the state of New York. It's insane. But we are finished with the government's case in chief, Letitia Tishy James's case, and we are still not done yet. We have one motions hearing that we're going to talk about today where Donald Trump's defense team filed what's called a request for a directed verdict saying that the government finished their case their presentation is so terrible that even if you found in their favor, judge, it's not enough to meet the threshold. In other words, they didn't meet the elements to even prove a claim. And so you have no choice. 
but to give us a directed verdict without us even presenting one shred of evidence. And so we'll go through the trial proceedings there and see how one avenue of attack is being defended against by Trump and his defense team in New York and by the case brought by Tishy Latish James. Now, we also have some inkling that Trump is aware of what they're doing, right? He understands that they want him in jail. I think that if they could take him off the field, they would do it. And Chris Christie is somebody who confirms that for us. So we're going to listen to him explain to us that they're going to be fighting all the way to the convention. He's basically guaranteeing that Trump is going to be convicted. And I think he's right about that. I mean, it's already set up as far as I can tell. And so Trump showed up on this show. Now, this is Buck Sexton, the ex-CIA officer who replaced Rush Limbaugh on his show. And so he has Trump on and he's there with Clay Travis and they're having an interview with Trump and they ask him this question, like, do you think this deep state is trying to put you in jail? Do you think these Democrats are trying to round you up and lock you up? Uh, I was always uh, of the opinion that a thing like this couldn't happen. In other words, you protect your former presidents. It's, uh, you know, it's a terrible thing to go after a former president other than if you're in a banana republic and a possible a future thing. president as well and which adds to it. yeah it's possible do you think they would put you in in jail and do you think that would benefit you i, I don't know i don't i don't, don't want to say talking. yeah i don't want to say about benefit because i don't want to predict that but uh would i would they if they could i think they would do it yeah i think it's not beyond them i think these are very uh deranged and angry people have you yeah they are deranged uh, they I are would... angry and that's why they want Trump gag. That's why they want him, honestly, I think in jail. There's a huge swath of people that would like to see that happen. And honestly, I think they'd like to see the reaction to that happen. Because obviously there would be a big contingent in this country of people who would be very upset about that, and rightfully so. But what would the consequence be? I think they are, I think they're kind of nudging for that. You know, they kind of would be okay if something kind of popped off of it. That way they could say, ah, MAGA insurrectionists. Ah, we told you, domestic violent extremism. Ah. So they're just, you know, kind of uh, squeezing everybody, putting everybody into this pressure cooker, and we're just getting warmed up, right? We have like a civil fraud trial we're talking about. Wait until we fast forward to March and we've got the January 6th insurrection trial underway. It's going to be madness. So Chris Christie is already up to speed on it. And, you know, the question is, why are these guys hanging around? Why are they, you know, with 2% of the polls just kind of, you know, sitting in, you know, in the, in the buffet line, waiting for something to fall off so they can pick it up off the floor. We're asking ourselves, what are you doing? And Chris Christie is here. He's explaining to us, well, Trump's going to be convicted. Hello. We already know it. He hasn't even had a trial yet. Everybody who used to be a prosecutor, so-called, and cared about the presumption of innocence and due process, he's already convicted the guy, right? So he's going to come and lecture us regularly about how Donald Trump is anti-democratic and whatever, but he's already convicting a guy. What happened to due process and the presumption of innocence, Chris? Donald Trump is going to be convicted. And what that New York Times poll from earlier the, this week shows you is that when he is convicted of a crime, his support collapses, especially in all those swing states that he was doing well in. But after a conviction, um, he will lose every one of those states to Joe Biden. Republican voters are going to get smart about that. They're going to see it and they're not going to make him our nominee. But we're going to have to fight it all the way to the convention. And that's exactly what I intend to do, because I'm the only candidate who's been making the case against Donald Trump from the day I entered the race. Not that he's not good for the party, which he isn't, but that he is unfit to be president of the United States, that our standards have to be higher than having a liar in the Oval Office, a criminal in the Oval Office. And I'm going to continue to make that case right up into the convention. Yeah, right up into the convention. So do you see where this is going? Now, Ron DeSantis is making similar, you know, similar statements saying, well, you know, the Alvin Bragg charge is illegitimate, but all these other three are legitimate. So in other words, these candidates are just waiting for the government to take off the top, take out their top opponent so that they can, you know, swoop in there, right? It's like actually pathetic and pretty cowardly as far as I can tell. It's like, why don't you just win outright? Why do you have to have the government of your political opponent take out the top person who you're trying to beat? It's pathetic, but of course, this is what the Republican Party is doing. And then you have Vivek at the debate saying, hey, Rana, why aren't you doing anything to rally resources, to muster up some legal defenses, to fight back against this one issue? Nobody even wants to talk about the Trump prosecutions as though the DOJ and the corrupt FBI are a non-issue in this election. While the rest of us are wondering why they're ignoring one of the key issues in the country, because as we said, if you can't have a functional justice system, what else do you have? Where, where are the laws? What do they matter? You have a bunch of laws written all over the place, but if you can't enforce them against the standard, 
they're meaningless. So this is what is happening in one sector of the prosecutions brought against Trump. We're back in New York City. Adam Klasfeld is reporting for us, and he is there in court. Now, he tells us the state's case is over. Now, they might recall CFO who was convicted Weisselberg back at some point, but at this moment, we're here for a motions hearing, right? So the government, Tishy, is trying to block testimony from the defense experts. They say, uh, yeah, you don't need to present a defense, okay? Your expert witnesses are irrelevant. So Trump, uh, why don't you just take your punishment and eat it? That's why we're here. So we begin, court's in session. Judge Angerong opens the door. Everybody's bracing for impact. Does he have a shirt on? Whew, he does. All rise. Oh, gosh, he's here. Thank God he's wearing his robe today. All right, please be seated. We begin. Now, Trump's attorney stands up. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, today, uh, the defense would like to begin with a presentation of a motion for a directed verdict. And this is, Your Honor, this, you know, as, as we know here, this is a motion for a directed verdict, meaning the case is now completed as the presentation has been completed by the government. They haven't met the standard, right? They've fallen below the threshold. There's no way they can, they can win. We're gonna deliver our argument. You're gonna believe us. And at the conclusion, you're gonna find that we are not liable for this civil fraud, no damages. Judge is like, yeah, right. So, okay, now Christopher Keese, Trump's defense, brought a slideshow with him for the arguments, which I'm a big fan of, shout out to PowerPoint. So he says, hey, um, Adam is saying, you know, the last time this happened, the judge said that there's enough evidence to fill this co courtroom. And we saw that, which is also amazing, meaning the judge has already come to a conclusion midway through the state's case back in October 25th, right? The judge, we were like on day like three or four or whatever it was, or week two or three or whatever. And, you know, judge has already made his decision. There's enough evidence here to throw him in jail for 30 years. All right. So Trump's defense says, Your Honor, we're here today asking the court for a directed verdict. And I want to be clear about this. What we heard from the state and from Tishy's prosecutor, the claims involve literally only successful and profitable loan transactions. Nothing was in the red. There was nothing delinquent. Nobody lost money. Everything was above board. Everybody was happy celebrating with champagnes. That's why we're here today. And I also want to add, these loans were so above board that there weren't even a late payments. Not a one. And the loans were all paid back on time. Trump pays on time. He says, Your Honor. And so, quite frankly, we're here. There's no victim in this case at all. There's no complaint. There's nobody even upset here that we're fighting for, so-called. There's no injury. And we have gone through this case with the government presenting their so-called evidence. And all of that has been established right now. And you can see it. And Your Honor, I want to be clear about this. My client, Mr. Trump, the former president of this United States, he has been an expert in real estate for the past 30, 50 years. And if you had him testify in any court in this country, he would be immediately qualified as an expert on real estate. In fact, there's nobody who's changed the skyline of New York City more than my client, this, the president. And he says, Your Honor, I also want to talk about this concept of materiality. Now, this is something the government spent a lot of time berating on. But materiality, that is to say, the question we have before us is, did any, did any of these so-called false financial statements, did they even matter at all to the banks and the insurance companies? I mean, they're saying there were differences here, Your Honor, but we've got no evidence of a victim. And we can't see if there was any harm. In fact, it, the question is, was it material at all? Did it matter to their loans or coverage? Or would, have they, would they have given Trump the loans but for those financial statements? Would they have done it anyways? Was it consequential? And the government hasn't proven it here. Next slide. You see here, Your Honor, the court stated, you said, Your Honor, this court in its testimony, you said the court is, quote, not here to hear what President Trump has to say. And he put that up on the big PowerPoint slide. And he's got his laser pointer. He's like circling it. Yeah, Judge, see that one? 
right there. And Angeron interjects, and he says, oh, wait a minute. To that slide, I'm offended. He says, Mr. Keese, did you hear what I said right after that? You're singling me out. Did you hear the next words that came out of my mouth? The government pipes up, you know, from their end. Tishy not, of course. She's back, you know, who knows if she's even there. But the AG's counsel said, Your Honor, I heard what you said. You said that you're here to hear Trump's answers to questions. You're here to hear Trump's answers to questions. So apparently Key said, I'm sorry, the judge said, I'm not here to hear. We're not here to hear what President Trump has to say. We're here to hear Trump answer questions. So I guess that little nuance is different, right? It's not Trump's opinion. It's Trump's answers to questions. And so Angeron says, I can't believe you used that slide, Mr. Keese. That, key, that slide is very misleading to this court. I didn't say that. I clarified it after. And Key says, uh, well, you said it, Judge. She says, fine, next slide. You know, I, th- I thought we were taking things out of context here for our own game. I thought you guys were doing that. I thought I could do that too. Sorry, I was mistaken. Next slide. He says, Your Honor, now I want to make the point that the disclaimers that Trump mentioned, and remember the disclaimer statement was this, is this paragraph in these contracts where the banks are doing these deals with Trump and you know Trump needs a loan to finance his property, he contacts the banks, the banks say, well, how many assets do you have to secure the loan? And Trump says, I got this evaluation for this stuff, I got all this stuff over here, and this secures your loan for 100 million, blah, blah. And so they're transacting and emailing and conversating all this time. And then when they finally fill out the paperwork, there's a disclaimer that Trump puts in there. He says, listen, okay, all this stuff that I told you, it's just words, right? Uh, this is like our opinion. And so we disclaim the accuracy of all of it, right? So you, just so you know, like this is our estimate. This is our best work. Like you trust us, okay? But but you got to do your own due diligence on this. You're a bank. Don't be dumb, okay? Don't take our word for it that there's like a hundred million here because you know we're not liable for the mistake. Figure it out on your own. If you do it and you think that we're solvent and you believe that the, the, our assets are legitimate because you can go look up the records and validate it, then good. Then you've done your own independent analysis and you're not relying on ours. And so you can't make us liable for this assessment, which we're just saying is our interpretation of an estimate. And they do this like many times. Okay. Every time they put a document up in front of Trump, he's like, yeah, there's a disclaimer in that one. Yeah. There's a disclaimer in that one. Yeah. And this is how banks do it. Like they know what they're doing. So he says, your honor, I want to be clear about this. Every disclaimer in Trump's statement of financial conditions undermines the claim of fraudulent intent. If he intended to commit fraud, then he wouldn't have put that in there. He would have just said, I have all of these assets. He would have just said, Mar-a-Lago is worth a trillion dollars. And the bank would have been like, wow, a trillion? He's like, yeah, totally. A trillion dollars. We're like, well, okay. But Trump says, no, he's like, no, I, it's a trillion dollars, you know, but uh, that's what I think it's worth. But uh, you might have a difference of, of opinion on that, right? And so you should do your own due diligence. I'm not guaranteeing you that. It's just my opinion. So go do your own thing. And that's not fraudulent, okay? It's saying, this is my opinion. Go investigate it. If you have a different opinion, then come back here and we can not do the deal. If I think it's worth a trillion and you think it's worth 18 million like Tishy does, then there's not going to be a deal, obviously. But if you go and you say, well, I guess your evaluations are pretty good and you agree to it, knowing that the disclaimer is in there, how is that intentional fraud when it's like openly in the document? Like, don't trust my my report. Figure it out on your own. So he says, it's clearly no intent of fraud. It's in every single contract that they put up on the screen. Angeron sitting there. He's like, oh, well, I don't like that point. It's a good point, but I hate your client. So uh, carry on, Mr. Keese. And he says, by the way, your honor, next slide. And there's a big, ugly face of Michael Cohen on the screen. You know how ugly that guy is. And he just is just the worst. And he's on the screen and everybody in the, in the jury's like, oh, in the court, oh, but he's on the screen. And they say, your honor, this convicted perjurer, Michael Cohen, he was in this courtroom and he admitted to perjury on the stand. 
We asked him point blank, aren't you a convicted perjurer? He's like, yeah, I am. I can't even believe I'm here. He said, Mr. Judge, uh, Mr. Uh, Your Honor, in fact, Cohen was here saying that he has lied in every court where he has appeared. We asked him time and again, did you lie here? Yeah. Did you lie here? Yeah. Did you lie here? Yeah. Are you lying now? No, I'm not lying now, says Michael Cohen. Okay. His slideshow brands Cohen star witness, hopefully with his ugly mug up there. And he and scoffs at what he describes as the AG, so Tishy, retreating about Cohen's significance to the case. He's like, so they brought him in here like he was going to be a slam dunk. And then they realize this guy's a total liar and has zero credibility at all. He says, Your Honor, moreover, Cohen's testimony that Trump gave him directives in code language, it's not even credible at all. He said that Trump was communicating him to do these things and then he just did it, but obviously it doesn't make sense and this is why. But the judge says, well, hold on a minute. He says, what I think, I think Cohen's claim here is conceptually the same as the scandal that brought Trump's first impeachment. He says, you know, I think the perfect call to Zelensky might be a code, he says. I don't know what the heck that has to do with anything in this case, but the judge is going back to the first impeachment with a phone call, which was illegitimate based on the Russia, Russia, Russia hoax. And Zelensky, he got a call. All right. So they continue. Keith says, next slide. Your Honor. Next, as we know, Tishy Latish and her prosecutors here today, they have not presented a single shred of proof that the banks in this case would have awarded loans for these projects if the statements of financial condition were different. Saying that old post office and 40 Wall Street, if the statements of financial condition were different, They haven't shown that the banks would have awarded the loans. He says, in fact, your honor, they continue doing business year after year after year. So they did a deal. The deal worked out. They continued to do their due diligence. So they're making their payments on time. This is looking good. Let's do it again. Year after year after year. He says, Latish brought in her expert witness and he put put her on the stand. And he was talking about damages. He was saying, well, Trump should have gotten a loan at this rate, but because Trump got a loan at that rate, that means Trump got a benefit. He should have paid more. But we're asking ourselves, well, did the bank care? Did they, like, they were satisfied with the terms of that loan. They got paid on time. They did business again. They were making money. So he says, your honor, they just brought in this expert witness to just opine on damages. He doesn't know anything about these deals. He simply substitutes his judgment for the sophisticated parties that actually negotiated this. And now he says, I'm going to turn this over to my partner, Trump's lawyer, Cliff Robert. Now he jumps up. We're talking about a directed verdict. He says, your honor, uh, just a few things I'd like to explain. He says, I want to add brief remarks on behalf of the president's son. This is the Trump family lawyer. So Christopher Keyes is now done. He says, so on behalf of the president's son, Don Jr. and Eric, he says, by the way, Your Honor, the reason why you should also grant a directed verdict here is because they were not involved in the creation of these statements at all. None of these statements of financial condition had any, the sons were not involved at all. And that's all I have to say, Your Honor. Judge looks over at Elena. Elena stands up. Your Honor, I've got brief remarks that I'd like to deliver for the defendants. Says we've got Alan Weisselberg, Jeff McConney were also individual defendants. And Alina says, your honor, I just want to be clear that there are many different people here. And we ask that you look at every individual defendant separately, individually, your honor. Thank you. Anything further from the defense, says the judge. You guys, Trump lawyers, uh, he's got a headache. He says, okay, perfect. My friends are up. Hey, government, Tish, you're up next. He, he throws this, you know, funny little gesture out there, little jest. He says, will there be an opposition to the motion for a directed verdict? Obviously. Government stands up, says, 
We will certainly oppose it, Your Honor. Oh, very clever. Just yeah, get to it already. Just oppose it. He says, Your Honor, I want to be clear about this. This is a documents case. This is Tish's prosecutor. Not Tish, obviously. She doesn't do anything in this case. This is a documents case, he says. And each of the three defendants signed documents stating that they were responsible for the information inside the documents and statements of financial condition. Says that's the graveyard the defendants keep whistling past. Oh, gosh. Go write a novel or something. Angeron says, uh, let me ask you a personal accountant. Let me ask you a personal accountant, the judge says to this government person. Do you file tax returns? Wallace says, yes, I do, Your Honor. Of course I do. I love paying my taxes. I'm a government bureaucrat. I think everyone should pay their taxes. He says, asked if he uses accounts, Angeron says, do you use accounts to file your taxes? He says, no, I didn't use accountants, but Trump did. What the heck is going on here? So he says, did Trump rely on those accountants at that time? So he used accountants. So he's a sort of getting into it with this guy. Uh, do you file tax returns? Wall says, yeah. Do you use accountants? He says, no, I don't, but Trump did. And so Trump relied on those accountants at that time, right? And Wallace, the government says, yeah, he did. Yeah, he did rely on the accounts, but he's still responsible for those returns. He said, if I gave my accountants false information, I'm liable for that if the returns are fraudulent. So they're saying if Trump gives the accounts the false info, then you're liable for the accounts, right? You can't give the accounts false info and then the accountants do what they think is right and then you blame the accountants for the false info. No. But if you give the accountants the correct info and then they give the false info, then they're responsible, right? So who's responsible for the info? So they say, so Trump gave him the false info and so he's liable for that. And the judge is like, oh, I get it. Thank you. That's how I'm going to get him. Perfect. So Trump's defense stands up. He's, uh, Keith says, your honor, quite frankly, what we have here from Tish's office is like throwing spaghetti against the wall to see what sticks. And Angeron says, hey there, easy, Keese. You got to be careful talking about spaghetti around lunchtime. I'm hungry. Speaking of that, it's a morning break. So the judge says, I've got meatballs on the brain. So he then runs out and does something. And we're back. We got a 10 minute break and we come back. And now we're back. And the government is saying that the state should benefit from a streamlined trial. So this guy, Andrew, stands up. He says, your honor, we should benefit from a streamlined trial that should flow from their pretrial victory, finding Trump liable for fraud. In other words, you've already settled most of this case. And so let's just get it over with. Like, just give us the damages. And Christopher Keese, Trump's defense lawyer, is not happy about whatever that was. He immediately jumps up, launches into personal attacks, against Tishy's lawyers. He says, you people are just the worst. We're here. You've been railroading our client for these past several weeks. And now you want to fast forward this and not even give my client due process. You guys are a piece of works. And the judge says, hey, Keys, calm down over there. That's unbecoming. You should apologize to them for insulting their feelings for, for, for when they violate your client's rights. He says, I'm not apologizing for anything. Deal with it. And so we're going to come back to that. Adam's going to report on that one. That sounds juicy. So then. <laughs> okay. So then here's what happens. He stands up. He says, you know what, your honor? I can't believe they're making this request. Tish's government prosecutor, he should get out his phone and, quote, check the internet. In fact, he may want to go check out Russia because Vladimir Putin has some openings for you over there, buddy. And he says, I hate Putin. I have a Ukraine flag in my bio. Judge, help. And the judge says, hey, don't make Putin jokes in my courtroom. Don't get Putin with me. And then he says, apologize, Mr. Keese. And he says, no. 
He is Putin's little stooge. Why doesn't he go work with Vladimir? And Angeron, he says, Keese, I will not have McCarthyist throwback language like that in my courtroom. And Keese says, I, I don't care. Your Honor, he's a communist. Send him to Russia. I think it was totally uncalled for and totally incorrect. <laughs> so apparently, Keese was saying, send him to Russia. He says, you can't say he's a communist. You can't say send him to Russia. That's totally uncalled for. And that's totally incorrect. And Keith says, okay, well, maybe he shouldn't go to Russia. He walks that statement back slightly. Like, okay, maybe we're not going to send him over to the, to the Russian front line. But he is a communist, and he's been making fun of me. He's been calling me names, ad hominem attacks, his entire trial. And he says, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have slammed him back, but he is a little, you know, commie. And by the way, he says, and by the way, Judge, these communists here, the whole world is watching. All right. The public is entitled to hear from all of our defense witnesses, and they're trying to keep four of our expert witnesses out of this case. This is a communist show trial. Maybe he should go work for Vladimir. And the government stands up and Ammer hammers this point. He's like, I'm not a communist. I support Zelensky. He says, Your Honor, the government is, tr is not trying to block the Trump's case. Only four witnesses whose testimony became irrelevant they're, they're not even relevant anymore. So you issued a pretrial ruling. That's what the issue was about speeding this up. They said, you've already issued a pretrial ruling, Judge. Their experts are not necessary because you've already found them liable. And these experts are going to come in and testify about stuff that you've already decided. And so it's moot now. And so let's just fast forward this. Don't give the defense an opportunity to present their witnesses. And Christopher Keyes, that's why he exploded, hits the roof. How dare you? Communist, right? We don't even get to present a, a case. Judge says, there's no goose or gander rule that the judge, he says, you're, he says, you've been hitting our side for this entire trial. And now you're trying to say, and, and, and the, the government continues, they say, your honor, and just because all of our witnesses got in, it doesn't mean that all of their witnesses get in. Okay. Just because we got a full opportunity to present our case doesn't mean they do. There's no goose or gander rule here that you need to sustain the equivalent number of objections. You can uh, just object them and sustain our objections and overrule theirs all day. And, and so far he's not taken the bait about the Putin comment. And so they have a lunch break. The judge goes and gets his meatballs. We're back. So Christopher keys comes back. He says, your honor, sorry. I was just a little hungry. I'd like to come back and I want to apologize for telling the government to consider a job with Vladimir. He said, I, your honor, when you're right, you're right. I want to apologize on the record. I definitely shouldn't have said that Amir should go work for Vladimir Putin. Should not have said that he's a communist. Definitely shouldn't have said that. Just want to clear that up on the record. The AG says, I accept your apology. Slava Ukraini, Ukraine. <laughs> he says, Angeron says, it would be prudent to let the witnesses in. He says, I think we should have these expert witnesses come. I don't want a retrial of this case, and I don't want to be reversed. And he says, so we better just get to him. He says, now I'm going to add and I'm going to allow the testimony without prejudice to objecting to anything that may be irrelevant. So I'm going to allow it in. And if there's stuff that we don't want in, we can deal with it there. He says, I want to be clear. Now, I'm not here as the judge today to value these properties, okay? I'm here to decide whether these statements of financial condition were fraudulent. That's all. He says, and I want to address this insinuation by you and Trump's defense counselor that I assigned a lowball value of $18 million to Mar-a-Lago. I didn't assign the $18 million. The judge doesn't like the blame for this. I didn't. I cited an independent appraisal from 2011 that said it was worth 18 million. And so I, I want to be clear that I specifically disclaimed assigning value to Mar a Lago. So get it right. He says, so what I'm going to do here is I am going to let the experts in, but I'm going to cut short any irrelevant testimony and I'm not going to take the path of least resistance. And so we stand adjourned today. He says, I'm going to take 
the directed motion, the, the directed verdict motion under advisement, which means I'm going to go think about it and rule on it. And we stand in recess. Trials adjourned. Have a great afternoon. We're done for the week. So they'll be adjourned. They will not be back tomorrow. And then I think the government is going to be done. We'll see Trump and his defense start their case next week. And so my friends, shout out to Klasfeld Reports, Adam Klasfeld. Be sure you're giving him a follow at Klasfeld Reports for doing the great reporting. We're grateful to have his transcript, his X script here on the platform. He does reporting as the senior legal correspondent over for The Messenger. Also previously worked for Law Crime in other areas. So be sure you're following him, doing great work. Thank you, Adam, for the great transcript and for the reporting. But that, my friends, is what's happening in New York. And so we're going to see... What happens next week when Donald Trump's case begins in full? We'll be here to cover it. I hope you join us as we do. And of course, if you miss anything here, you can catch all the reports and all the segments on our website at robertgovea.com. Sign up for our daily newsletter there so this stuff gets delivered to your inbox because there's a lot of Trump trials happening. We don't want you to miss a thing. We'll see you there and here on the next one and look forward to it. All right, my friends. Now, let's turn our attention over to what's happening in the January 6th case in Washington, D.C. But it's not Judge Chutkin's courtroom. We're going up a level to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. Donald Trump is talking vengeance. What happens when he wins the White House now that he's been the victim of a bunch of DOJ prosecutions, totally illegitimate? What happens when he gets control of the wheel, when he takes over the DOJ? Is it going to be a favor returned? He says, absolutely, and I certainly hope so. But the reason why Trump is under such attack from various different entities, four different indictments, civil suits, ballot removal suits all over the country, is because he has a big voice. He's got a big following. A lot of people are at his back, which is why the courts are trying to gag him so that he cannot talk about Things like this, he cannot say that the DOJ is illegitimate. They want to stop him from causing another so-called insurrection, from rallying the people of America to support him against the weaponized DOJ. And so this is what Trump says. As soon as we're done here, we're going to see the appeal that Trump is filing to lift this gag permanently so he can have more free speech throughout the campaign season. Well, and we will start by exposing every last crime committed by crooked Joe Biden, because now that he indicted me, we're allowed to look at him. Fair game. But All he did game. real bad things. We will restore law and order to our communities. And I will direct a completely overhauled DOJ to investigate every Marxist prosecutor in America for their illegal, racist, and reverse enforcement of the law. And they do not want that to happen, okay? These DOJ prosecutors, they are now kind of fighting for their lives, aren't they? If Trump wins, there's going to be some big consequences for their whole corrupt entity. And so you're going to see here the actual appeal that Trump has filed with the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. We're going to go through it. It's a 67-pager, and we've been following this litigation since the very beginning. The January 6th case taking place out of the D.C. Circuit Court. This is on appeal, and we're going to be scheduled for oral arguments in this case on November 20th, 2023, so be sure that you're subscribed so that when we cover the oral arguments and see what the Court of Appeals does, you can join us on it. But this is the big filing. It's a 67-pager, as I mentioned. It's the opening brief of Donald Trump up to the Court of Appeals. And we'll take a look at some backstory on this, but it's a big filing and a lot of appellate memos and opening briefs have a lot of law in it. So we wanna hit the highlights and tease out exactly what's going on here. But let's start off by starting with the introduction and seeing what Trump's defense is writing, saying, all right, Court of Appeals, we just got out of Judge Chutkin's courtroom. It's kind of messy down there. Let me tell you what's going on. Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court has never allowed the government to prohibit candidates from communicating relevant information to voters during an election. Never happened. And they're citing a Supreme Court case. This is a U.S. Supreme Court case from 2002. And it's a, it, so they're saying to the Supreme Court, right? This is ultimately probably going to go there. And they're telling the Court of Appeals this. They say, accordingly, no court, no court has ever 
ever imposed a gag order on the political speech of a candidate for public office, let alone a leading candidate for president until now. Never, ever, not one time in American history has it happened. But on October 17th, Judge Shutkin issued a gag order. And the gag order restricts Trump from making public statements about key aspects of the prosecution. Now, he seeks to replace the Biden administration. All of these issues are inextricably intertwined with the 2024 campaign. And the gag order obviously violates Trump's First Amendment rights. And it also doesn't even give a whip about our rights, the audience's rights, to hear from Trump. Now, given its extraordinary nature, one would expect an extraordinary, extraordinary justification for the gag order. But none exists. In fact, the gag order rests entirely and wrongfully on a classic heckler's veto. Speculation that the Trump audiences might react to his speech with, quote, harassment, whatever the heck that means, or, quote, threats, all of which is already illegal, by the way. You're not allowed to do that. You can't just call and threaten people. The First Amendment forbids the heckler's veto, saying that Trump might say something that might cause somebody to do something, and therefore Trump can't speak. Obviously, if you take that to a, its limit, if you extended that, that would be an insane country. There would be no free speech if we were responsible for everything that everybody did after they heard something from us. So they say, even if it were legally viable, which is not, there's not even any evidence that supports any of the actual threats or harassment in the first place. Saying Trump has made many public statements about this case in the three months since he's been indicted. Many statements. But the DOJ has submitted no threats. They've submitted no harassment. Any actual evidence that this has occurred to prosecutors, witness, witnesses, or anybody. Instead, the prosecution themselves even admit, they say, quote, of course, this prejudice is speculative, but we're worried something might happen, and so we have to gag him now. They say, court, a prior restraint cannot be based on speculation. The court cannot silence Trump just based solely on anticipation and uh, of the reaction of his audiences saying Chutkin lacks the authority to muzzle the core political speech of the leading presidential candidate and saying Trump is entitled and the American people are entitled to hear his political messages and saying the gag order should be immediately reversed. Now they tell us what is happening, sort of the jurisdiction, how the court got the case. They ask these two very important questions and this is always fun on appeal. We try to ask ourselves, Specifically, out of all these 67 pages, what are the two questions that we're trying to answer here? Number one, question, whether the gag order violates the First Amendment rights of both Trump and tens of millions of Americans to engage in and hear the core political speech in the middle of a presidential campaign. So his right to speak, our right to receive. And two, another issue, whether the gag order is unconstitutionally vague. So void for vagueness. Two issues. They're going to ask the Court of Appeals to respond to this. Is this unconstitutionally vague? Simple. Yes or no. Or is it going to be, does the gag order violate the rights of yes, both, no, both, or yes, one, or the other? On the first question. Trying to make it almost logical, like programming. So they give us the statement of the case. They say, all right, Court of Appeals, President Trump is the leading candidate for president of the United States. Even polls are showing that. New York Times, CBS, Siena. He holds dominating leads in polls for the Republican nomination, and he holds a substantial lead over Biden in polling. He's got over 100 million followers, and his public statements reach far and wide. Now, Trump, as we know, was indicted, supposedly, for, quote, obstructing official proceedings and, quote, defrauding the United States. But the indictment in this case and the issues surrounding it are inextricably intertwined with the campaign for re-election. One commenter described the issues surrounding the indictment as, quote, central to Biden's re-election argument. And Trump is literally being prosecuted by the person he's trying to beat at the ballot box. Trump's opponents, including witnesses, routinely attack him. They say Trump's not fit to be reelected. They say the conviction should disqualify him. And Trump responds to these statements and says that this is intending to interfere with the election. Now, on the day that the indictment was filed, 
the special counsel prosecuting Trump gave a speech during a press conference falsely saying that Trump's responsible for the attack on January 6. Now, this statement, they say, egregiously mischaracterized the indictment, and the special counsel drove negative headlines about this indictment. So in other words, Jack Smith came out and said a bunch of stuff about Trump that was not actually in the indictment, and the media went with the things that he said, which were not true, like didn't even charge him for crimes for that. So before and after the indictment, there were a long series of leaks of confidential information, all of it meant to smear Trump. Witnesses also can attack Trump. Mike Pence, Bill Barr, Mark Milley, all of them going all over the place, saying Trump's term would be a horror show, says Bill Barr. Mike Pence made similar statements before his failed campaign. And while this case is pending, Trump is engaged in core political speech, responding to his critics. He routinely posts statements about this stuff. He described the indictment. He said that they're trying to take away his free speech. But none of Trump's statements, not one of them, constitutes a threat, nor fighting words, nor incitement, nor anything advocating for imminent lawless action. And so the prosecution did not contend that they fall outside of the First Amendment or that they are part of an exception to the First Amendment. And the district court did not find that. But instead, Jack Smith moved for a gag order. But they didn't contend that Trump's comments were actual threats. Instead, the motion just gave several examples of some individuals who claimed that they got harassing, threatening communications back in 2020, years ago. The prosecution provided screenshots of Trump's social media posts calling for a federal takeover. And the prosecution said that this could possibly impact the jury panel when he was talking or the witnesses talking about little Mike Pence and other things. But the DOJ and the deranged thugs over there at Jack Smith's office, they didn't present any evidence that any prosecutor or any potential witness had actually experienced any threats or harassment at this time. No statements by Trump or any court staff that showed that they were the cause of new harassment. They re filed their reply, but it didn't include any actual evidence. It's all speculative. No actual evidence that any individual actually felt those threats. And so in October, the court held a hearing on it, and they said that they might inspire third-party agents to act. When the defense team asked Judge Chutkin, when they said, Chutkin, the government has submitted no evidence to substantiate its concerns about harassment or intimidation. The judge responded, well, why should they have to submit evidence? Uh, because you're a court, that's why. And when the district court asked the government, they said, well, why don't you have any evidence? They said, well, it's speculative. I mean, we're speculating. Now, they wanted to postpone the case until after the election, until things cooled down. But the judge said, no, like we are going to trial in, Jan in March because we need to. This is the only way we're going to try to stop Trump. I think it's going to backfire on him, but that's what their efforts are. So then Judge Chutkin held the hearing, issued the gag order, and made their determination. They said alternative measures like jury questioning are not sufficient to remedy everything, and so they've got to gag Trump. They, the court specifically said, I'm not giving any weight to the fact that you're conducting a political campaign. It said, I don't care about the election. I only care about our trial. And so Trump here is now in front of the court. We filed our notice and motion and opening brief in our appeals. And here is what they say, Your Honor, at the court. The gag order violates Trump's rights and 100 million Americans' rights. He's got a fundamental constitutional right to spread his core political speech and message. As do the audience. The gag orders are violating our rights. And because it violates our First Amendment rights, it's invalid on its face. Any restriction on speech requires a clear and present danger to the administration of justice. Clear and present danger, not speculative. And this is also Trump's campaign speech that's being gagged, which is some of the most protected speech in the whole country, because that is how you change the system, is by campaigning against the government. In fact, you can't sue the government when the government does something bad. They say, no, you have to, I mean, in most cases, unless you're directly harmed, they say you have to go, you have to go vote it's a political issue. It's not a legal issue. 
So if you have a specific claim for many cases in this country, the only recourse is by rallying people to your cause. And in order to be able to do that, you got to be able to speak. The gag order's sole justification for the gag is that Trump's speech might, quote, hypothetically lead unidentified independent third parties to subject prosecutors and potential witnesses and court staff to harassment. This is a classic heckler's veto. It's exactly what it means. Under the First Amendment, speakers are not chargeable with danger when their audiences might react. The government cannot censor the reaction to the speakers by, because of the reaction of the speaker's audience. The gag order is invalid on its face, face or at the very least subject to strict, very strict scrutiny that it cannot stand. Saying the prosecution made no showing that the gag order was necessary. When the gag order was entered, the case had already been pending for three months. Trump had been talking about it for a long time, but there was no evidence of threats. Trump had been saying stuff since the beginning. Nothing changed. The gag order also gave no meaningful consideration to, to more le less restrictive measures, and they didn't find anything about it. And the gag order was also sweepingly overbroad, saying it restricts large amounts of core political speech that poses no plausible threat to the administration. It's a heckler's veto. It silences public criticism of public figures. It stops Trump from responding to people who openly attack him in media, in political debates, in books. It's impermissibly one-sided. Trump's opponents can attack him without restriction, but he is silenced from responding in kind. And it's also unconstitutionally vague. It doesn't satisfy exacting standards of clarity. The key operative word is a target. A range of meanings here. We don't know who is a reasonably foreseeable witness. Trump can't measure his conduct against that because there's 13 million pages in this case and the government doesn't even have a witness list or even a list of potential witnesses. So we have no idea how big this is. So Trump is left only to guess what a reasonably foreseeable witness is and who that might be. And it also says Trump can't talk about the substance of their testimony, which is also also indeterminate. We can't know what it is, especially months before the trial. And so the judge says that there are carve outs that we can have general criticism of the government. Isn't that nice? They gave Trump some permission to communicate his grievances against the government. A general, though, don't make it too harsh. OK, our feelings might get hurt. President Trump must therefore guess when criticizing those deranged thug prosecutors. All of these problems make the gag order arbitrary and discriminatory and unconstitutionally vague, saying it violates every fundamental principle of the First Amendment. It's invalid on its face. And they're going to give us a lot of law here. So we'll fast forward through a lot of this, but you can see. It says it's not a clear and present danger in this case called Landmark Communications, SCOTUS told us we have to have a clear and present danger. It has to be a high standard. District Court said very much the same thing. And it applies here. The gag order requires the same standard. The only evidence to, to support this inference of a clear and present danger, like the only fact that says it might be clear and present is, uh, is some inference from nearly three years old. And President Trump has made many statements about this case. And so if there was a threat of harassment or harm, wouldn't we have seen it by now? And by the way, they're also admitting that this prejudice is purely speculative, saying that this also violates the First Amendment in many ways. Prior restraint, if you're going to gag someone and muzzle them, it's got to meet the highest of standards. And it's not doing that. Also noting that this is Trump's political speech in the middle of a campaign. It is the essence of self-governance. No form of core political speech receives greater protection than campaign speech. Lies at the core of our process. Now, the only two cases that address gag orders on criminal defendants who are also political candidates are Ford and Brown. And they granted virtually complete exemptions for the defendant's campaign speech. In fact, the Sixth Circuit ruled in Ford. They said here, 
The defendant is entitled to attack the alleged political motives of the Republicans. While he claims he's persecuting him because of his political views and his race, he's entitled to fight the obvious damage to his political repu reputation in the press and the court of public opinion. He will soon be up for re-election and his opponents will in attack him as an indicted felon. He'll be able to respond in kind. And so they said virtually no restrictions on their speech. President Trump's message is specifically that the criminal cases against him are part of politically motivated, an unconstitutional campaign to silence him. It lies at the very heart of the First Amendment. And so when Chutkin tried to set bounds for Trump, they did so to cordon off what they deemed was unnecessary. And they're trying to dictate the scopes of his political campaign. All of that, of course, unconstitutional. They talk about the First Amendment saying that the gag order has been widely criticized all over the place and it imposes a heckler's veto. You can't chill the speech based upon the reaction to the speaker. This gag order also shields public figures from criticism. Trump can't comment on certain public figures, saying that the gag order su suppresses Trump's ability to attack the special counsel. In Rosenblatt, another case, the First Amendment, we found, does not tolerate an order to shield public figures from criticism. The gag order also viewpoint limits. It discriminates against Trump. At oral argument, they said that there were concerns about Trump and Trump's comments about Mark Milley. They also brought up books and Milley being criticized. And they said that they interpreted Trump's speech out of context and then discriminated against his viewpoint. And so what the judge did is not going to survive any layer of scrutiny. No doubt evidence was scarce. The record was relied on from outside the court record. There were misleading reports. And there are many other alternatives that could be used to protect the court that the judge didn't even consider. And says, as we conclude, that the gag order is overly broad, it's unconstitutionally vague, and that all of their other arguments are not relevant. In conclusion, at the district level court of appeals, Trump's defense says, therefore, the district court opinion and order should be reversed in its entirety. If the court affirms any portion of the order, Trump respectfully requests that the court extend the administrative stay for seven days to permit him to seek emergency relief from the U.S. Supreme Court, which is where this is going to go. John Sauer, writing on behalf of Donald Trump, also signed off by John Loro and Todd Blanche on behalf of the former president, submitted to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. Oral argument set for November 20th. And so, my friends, we'll be here to cover that. We'll see what Trump's defense team says in the Circuit Court of Appeals. I believe that this is going to be bound for the Supreme Court. And we'll be following it as it does. Thank you for subscribing and joining us. Thank you for inviting a friend or family member to come check out our channel. Follow along with the court documents as we do. And we'll look forward to seeing you and them on the next one. All right, my friends. Now, we got one final segment on the day and this one involves our favorite crackhead the president's son hunter now this one involves a subpoena we're not done yet hunter biden's art dealer gets a subpoena of course we know hunter biden is now an artist and a very good one apparently he has transmogrified his artwork from this hunter biden mucus covid painting which was one of his earlier renditions into stuff that's now selling for like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the question is why? How did he metamorphosize into a talented artist? Is that reality or is this just what some might speculate to be a money laundering? Well, Comer is digging into it. He's trying to get to the bottom of it. In fact, he sent subpoenas. We already know that James Biden got a subpoena, Hunter Biden got a subpoena and others. But today we wake up and George S. Burgess, the art dealer, the guy who houses all of Hunter's so-called artwork, also gets a subpoena, as does who we think is an art buyer, along with two other business associates from the Biden crime family. Comer says, we're not done yet. We're going to hear reaction from him, and we'll see what the White House has to say about it before Byron Donald's 
issues a warning to the Biden crime family and Hunter in particular. But Comer said, yep, not done yet. We got a bunch going out here. In addition to Hunter and James and letters to Sarah and Hallie and others, says we also got Hunter Biden's business associates, Eric Sherwin, Mervyn Yan. We also got the New York City and China art dealer known as George S. Burgess, the artist host of Hunter, and then Hunter's art patron and major dem donor. Her name is Elizabeth Neftali. And so all of those got subpoenas and this is what they look like so we take a look at the first one let's go to mr burgess himself the artist who helps hunter saying the committee on oversight and accountability now issues a subpoena by authority of house of the representatives congress of these united states to george s burgess telling him you must appear for a deposition at the Congressional Rayburn House Office Building on December 15th, 2023 to testify for a deposition. And we'll be looking forward to seeing what he has to say. Signed by James Comer, U.S. House of Representatives. Same story goes to Elizabeth Hirsch Naftali. Subpoena, this one for 12-1, December 1st, bright and early in the month of December. We've got two other subpoenas that went out. This one was to Eric Sherwin, who is the associate for the Biden crime family. He's got a depot scheduled for 1219. Man, Congress is going to be busy. And then finally, the last one went out to Mervyn Yan, the other business associate. He's scheduled for 12-4 for a depot with Congress. And so some good subpoenas flying out there. We'll see if they show up for it. But James Comer explains what's happening here. There is a pattern, and he's going to walk us through this and explain exactly what the strategy is before we hear from Russell Fry from South Carolina, as well as from Byron Donalds, when this video loads up and presents itself for all of us to watch in a minute. And if it doesn't, we've got a backup plan. Let's see if we can just uh, get that one going while we're here, if it will load. Sometimes these things get a little wonked out. Joining us now, he is the chairman. Here it is. We'll leave that one aside and go back to Comer here. This is what Comer had to say in his explanation. Of the House Oversight and Accountability Committee. James Comer is with us. Sir, how are you? I'm well. You know, I, I asked you a while back, I said, at what point do you think it's going to be appropriate to start sending out subpoenas? And you said you wanted to get all your ducks in a row, you wanted to follow all of these suspicious activity reports and all of these um, shell corporations, follow the money. Do you feel you've, you've got enough information now that you have some pretty strong questions for these guys? I do. I think we're at the point now where uh, we can connect the dots. We understand what the scheme was. We understand who the people were who were wiring the money. We believe we know why, but we want to hear from the Bidens. And uh, we're at the point now where the evidence is overwhelming. And now we can bring the Bidens in and ask them substantive, specific questions about things that uh, we have serious concerns about. How many shell corporations have you been able to discover through your investigation that the Biden family had? Over 20. And, you know, when you talk about James Biden, I'm not sure exactly what his businesses were. Uh, but with respect to Hunter, uh, we're, we're confident that these businesses did not produce a good or service. And we really have no idea what they did, uh, especially considering the fact that uh, they would go months without any revenue. And then all of a sudden, a, a million dollar wire from a foreign national would appear. Uh, and then the next day, they would start the laundering process where they would wire money from account to account, from shell company to shell company. Uh, you know, we see a similar pattern with Jim Biden, but we want to ask Jim Biden exactly, you know, what did you do? Uh, what, what are all these transactions in your so-called business? And what involvement did your brother have in these shady business schemes? Let me, let me go through the timeline of Burisma. We know that Hunter admitted on GMA that it, he had no experience. All right, so that is the conversation with Hannity and Comer. And so Comer says, we've got some good information. We're going to keep digging into it. 
Here is Corrine at the White House. She got asked about this. It was just breaking, saying that, hey, uh, Corrine, the president's son and the bro got subpoenas, and the rest of the fam's also getting some, too. They're getting letters for transcripts and uh, depots and other things. Any reaction? The House Oversight Committee has issued subpoenas for um, Hunter Biden, James Biden, and Biden family business associate Rob Walker. Do you have a comment on that? So look, as you just mentioned, it's just breaking. Uh, so I don't have this information in front of me. I'm just hearing from you. Uh, certainly, I would refer you to any uh, of the, the personal representatives on, on this, uh, on, on your question. But I will have to say something that I've said many times. Uh, this is an investigation uh, that has been going on for a year now and has turned up zero evidence of wrongdoing by the president. Not sure about uh, because that. There is none. Uh, but. Republicans continue to double down on a baseless, a baseless a smear campaign against the president and his family. All right, baseless. We know that word means usually true. So Kareem's doing the same thing, doesn't have much information, refer you to someone else. Congress not buying it. This is Representative Russell Fry from South Carolina. He's saying we've got a lot to go on. We're just taking our time. And we've talked about this, the timeline. When will it crest? When will we see the full capacity of the Republican investigation come to the climax. Hopefully it's not too soon before it can have maximum impact during the election, because why? They're gonna be doing the same thing. They've got the March 3rd trial for the J6 case. They want the May classified documents case. Fannie might have her RICO case some in there, somewhere in there, time will tell. But here's Russell Fry explaining they've got an alternative strategy. Everything that we've done up to this point for 10 months uh, has been the culmination step by step, crossing every T, dotting every I, and now subpoenas are finally released. Uh, and so the Biden family is going to be spending a lot of time through Thanksgiving and yeah. the Christmas holiday in front of the House Oversight Committee. Yeah, yeah a, a winter of depositions and stench with Hunter Biden walking into the congressional courtroom. A winter of deposition and stench. Yeah, well, Congressman, according to pre this press release here, the Biden family and their business associates and their companies have received over $24 million from foreign nationals for over the course of approximately five years. That's a ton of money, including millions of dollars from China, Russia, Ukraine, Romania, Kazakhstan. I mean, whose side are they on? Right. I think that's the, the, the big question is what services again, and this is why it's so important to have them come in. What services did you provide? What things did you build or widgets None. did you create? Nothing. My estimation is nothing because we haven't seen anything from the Biden administration from the family that leads us to believe that. But we see transactions, particularly transactions most troubling from overseas where it's kind of laundered through multiple companies before it ultimately mm -hmm. ends into the direct pocket of Joe Biden himself. All right. So they're digging into it crossing the T's, dotting the I's. And Byron Donalds also has a little bit of a warning over for the Biden family. Here's what he says. They've now been subpoenaed by Congress. So if they choose to ignore a congressional subpoena, there are legal remedies for that. I would not recommend that to Hunter Biden or to Jim Biden or anybody else in the Biden family. If they believe that what we are saying is false, well, then there's an opportunity to come and prove come that and in. actually discuss that, whether it's going to be through depositions or whether that's going to be through testimonies to the committee or whether that's going to be in open committee hearings. They can make that case very clearly. So if they have nothing to hide, I I don't know what the problem is. Look, I think what's going to happen is we're going to try to get some transcribed interviews with several people surrounding the Biden family who are either been tied into some of these account gains, money has moved to them or through some of their bank accounts. We want to be able to do that and then cooperate that information with bank records and financial documents that we have gone through the process of gaining access to. And so I think that's going to take probably a couple of weeks to a month to sift through all that because people are going to need their time to do this work, being very careful, being very precise, wanting to make sure that we get the record absolutely correct nice so we'll see if they get any progress made they got a bunch of depositions scheduled subpoenas have gone out now to a whole slew of people we had three yesterday four more today all going after the biden crime family and their associates and the question will be do they show up if they do show up do they plead the fifth and hunter just says i got an open criminal case right now i'm not talking about anything or the biden crime family saying uh, James Biden saying, we've got an open criminal case, right? I was maybe under investigation by the FBI. The problem is, if they do that, then people can rightfully turn around and say, well, I thought you said it was innocent. I thought these were just loans. 
And maybe the right to remain silent is not useful in a criminal court. Like legally, you can't use a person invoking their right to remain silent against them. But you could infer guilt in a civil case. And of course, the American public can, can clearly infer guilt because Trump doesn't get the benefit of the doubt, any presumption of innocence or any due process at all. And we know that the DOJ and the FBI has been covering up for Hunter and the Biden crime family, going so far as to warn them about warrants being executed for Hunter storage facilities so they could clean it out. And so this is going to be a saga that continues. The subpoenas are going out. The depositions are being scheduled. We'll be here to continue to cover it. And I hope you do join us and follow along as we get into it. Thank you for subscribing, my friends. Thank you for liking this video wherever it is you're watching it. We've got a lot more to attend to, and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one. All right, my friends. Well, that is it for us on the day, my friends. And so we covered some good ground today. And here is what is in the house. We covered Hunter's art dealer and congressional subpoenas and Byron Donald's issuing a warning. We talked about Trump saying revenge, revengeance is coming and filing the DC Circuit Court of Appeal opening brief, which we'll see what the government says in their response. And then lastly, Trump is saying they're going to put me in jail. And we had some good trial X scripts over on the X platform, courtesy of Klasfeld Reports, who was telling us what was happening inside the courtroom with those communist Russian Putin stooges inside uh, Tishy's office. But now, my friends, it is time to hear from you. And we're going to go over, of course, to our members only after party at watchingthewatchers.locals. Dot com as soon as we're done here saying thank you to your support and your donos and man we got a real we got a couple really big donos in the house from marion holtzman marion i've seen those uh, hanging up there this whole show thank you so much for those man extremely extremely generous and so we're gonna say hello to everybody in the house and we're starting the day off with tony hay Munkett. Bringing in some new members, five new members, Renee G, Dan D, Narsos is here, Cynthia C, we got B-dubs is joining us, and thank you, Tony Hay, for bringing in five new members to our YouTube members, and hey, YouTube members, join us for the members only after party on the community tab section on the channel homepage, Just keep scrolling down a little bit, and you'll find a community members only post that has the private telegram link, grab it, and join us, that's where we do our uh, after parties for our YouTube members. Otherwise, we'll see you in the morning. See you on Saturday. Thank you, Tony Hay. Very, very nice of you. Thank you for sending that one in. We also want to say thank you to... What is going on right here? My windows are all discombobulated. As I know, I know how... I know we all know how that feels. Spuds is here. What's up, Spuds? Says, Rob, wasn't Christie's Bridgegate scandal criminal? I don't know the answer to that. I think it, it could have potentially have been criminal for Christie. I mean, I don't think he got charged with crimes. Did he? I don't know. That was a little bit of time ago. I'm not real sure. We'd have to double check on that one, but it's a good question, Spuds. A bad poet, and thank you for the don't know, Spuds. A bad poet says, Chris Christie, still being a member of the Republicans is another great reason. Ronna McDaniel should be fired. Happy almost Friday, a bad poet in the house. It's good to see you, a bad poet. Well, I think they're probably friends. I, you know, I, don't, I don't know if they go out to dinner together or what. B-Man says the president already lost with Judge Joker, but will win on appeal. All this is so Tishy can stand at the podium and say, I kept my promise from B-Man over on the tubes. Thank you, B-Man. Yeah, I, I'm hopeful about that. I mean, I'm hopeful that as we get out of this like kangaroo layer, you know, this kind of ridiculous elected judges layer, we get into court of appeals, we get into some federal courts where we have you know, the problem with the elected positions is there's really no, there's no disincentive to be political because you just have to be political to win re-election. As long as you do that, you're good. So if you've got a, an elected Democrat who's a, a an AG, an elected judge who's also a, a Democrat, like it's, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for collusion here if you want to, you know, take an ax to your Republican opponent, which is what they're doing. Thank you, B-Man. Very nice of you. We got this one from a bad poet says, are you going to start the Trump lawyer fan club? I don't think so. No, that's not on the agenda. I don't know that there's that many lawyers who are Trump fans. I mean, most lawyers are far left, honestly. Like lawyers are in general as a category, 
vote Democrat in massive troves. But he needs a he needs a defense team. I don't think he needs a fan club. He needs a Trump lawyer defense team is what he needs, is what would be useful. And thank you, a bad poet. It's a good idea. This one from Marion Holtzman. Marion, you sent two of these in today, my friend. Extremely generous. I'm very grateful to you. Thank you for those. Says Marion says, thank you for your daily updates. I am sharing you on X on the quote left posts to combat their misinformation. Keep up the good work. I appreciate you doing so. And Marion, really, thank you for that. Very, very generous. And honestly, thank you for sharing the post as well. That is extremely, extremely valuable. And that's that's part of the strategy, Marion, is what we're trying to do now. So on X, we are posting our segments and we're also posting the shorts, but we're turning the shorts into horizontal. So we're trying to do like one minute snippets where we can just hit some of the highlights of the show. And so that we can, you know, we can share those around. I think that I, you know, I think it's important. I know it's self-serving to say like share this stuff, but I think that if more people could see what was happening, you know, not read the article about what Politico says happened or what the New York Times says happened, but if they could see and like hear what the judge is doing and see what the documents say from the defense perspective, I think that, you know, that type of information is, is useful because a lot of people just don't know. They just see the headline. Oh, Trump's got convicted, indicted again. Oh, Trump, Trump, Trump. But if you unpack it all, it really, I think, can help you know awaken people to the truth, to the reality. And so, Marion, extremely generous. Thank you for being so generous, for being so sherry on the X. Doing good work out there. Yeah, and, we're, and you know, we're we're trying we're trying to like be prolific here. We're trying to produce a lot so that there's a lot of ammunition, you know, political informational ammunition, so that that's possible. To just, oh no, here's the document. Oh no, here's somebody explaining. Oh no, here it is. And you know, all day, every day, it's just like, want to, want to be consistent, want to build in almost like an assembly line to just keep printing responses to their lies and, and help wake people up. And so Marion, you're a part of that. Thank you for helping to support us with your nice dono and your amazing shares. And Sportsfish, man, another really nice one over from Rumble. Says, keep up the good work, Rob. The team loves your show and appreciates your efforts. Thank you, Sportfish. Sportfish, a membo over on the Rumbles. Also sending in a very nice dono. And thank you, Sportfish. Man, we're keeping it up. We are going to keep on getting started. And we were talking about this. You know, this is just, this is just, I think, the early stages of, of, of where we're going. I mean, this this next year, like we are, we are less than 12 months away from the election. Like, did you, like, it's November 9th. One year from now, less than 365 days from now, there is going to be another election and we probably are not going to have an outcome on that day. I just, you know, everybody's going to uh, fight over it. So, but we'll have a lot more knowledge about this. And so it's like go time now, you know, it's go time. And it is, it is, I think important, you know, like just, you can even just re-upload it on your X account. Like it's not about necessarily... It's just about sh- sh- spreading the, I just want people to, to know what's going on, right? It, you know, I just want people to know. So Sportsfish, thank you for that. We're going to keep grinding on and having some fun as we go. And thank you for it. Marion, another very, very nice one. Marion, man, I'm humbled by your generosity. Thank you for it. Don't even know what to say. So generous says, hit that like button. If you haven't already done so and share Robert to the lefties, they so need a different point of view. And that's what we're trying to do. You know, we're trying to invite people to come and join us, explore these topics, have a little bit of fun, see things from a different perspective. And so try to mix entertainment with, with you know, education and with some actual primary source documents so that people can, can, can see it from a different angle. And your support, the donos, the shares, the community that we're building, like it re- really wouldn't be possible without you. So Marion, again, extremely generous. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate it. This one came in from Box Lane Productions, and I'm grateful for all the donos, my friends. Extremely grateful. Thank you for sending these in. Box Lane Productions says, it looks like Hunter was using money laundering to express himself. Well, I don't know what, yeah, that COVID painting, it looks like mucus or like mold or the other thing is like a bowl of milk or something. He had some like other paintings that look like, you know, uh, just gross stuff. Uh, He might've been on crack. I don't know what he was doing. But he's an artist now, as he says. And so thank you, Box Lane, for that one. Who knows what he's doing? Sean Wookie, what's up, Sean? Says, thanks for all you do. Give me the blue. Sean Wookie for three months. 
And we got the Jen Saki gif in there for our member membo only gifts. And uh, thank you, Sean, for that. Thanks for being a member, man. Third way, uh, one third of the way to a baby. Getting pretty close. And we got, thank you, Sean. We got Linda T is here. What's up, Linda? Thank you for sending in the dono. And it's your first super chat on our channel. Welcome. You know, first time. We love that. So thank you, Linda, for sending it in and joining us here today. We also want to say what's up to our friends on the X platform. Our X platform where our, where you can also congregate. So it's another good place to go meet people. What I like about X is, you know, you can kind of retweet other people, leave comments out there and kind of mix it up out there in the wild and see who else is out there. And you'll probably recognize some people, you know, from the chat here, see them out in the wild on the X. We got nine viewers over on X. Woo, woo, man, things are getting pretty crazy. That's almost 10, which means it's pretty wild. Norman's here. What's up, Norman? Danny McWilliams, Peas and Butters here. We've got Mim, uh, M. McDee's here. We got Old Drill Sergeant. George is over there. Let's see who's got in the house. We're just doing a quick safety check scroll to see how we're doing. We got this one. What's up, Norman Lee? Is in the house. Says, thanks, Rob. Simply the best. Danny McWilliams is here. Says, even Fox News is saying that people should write, a, write DC about the judge. Peas and Butters says, I get to be a few of one of those on X. What's up, Peas and Butter? We got M. McD says, I try to watch every one of your videos. Well, thank you for doing that. Says, very informative, but I don't usually catch them live. And I love how you're putting them up in segments. Are the short videos segments or are some of them one-offs? So the short, the short we have, let's take a look at my thread. Let's take a look at my profile and I'll try to answer those questions. I'll see actually what we're doing. I think we just made a change. And I think it's been implemented. Old Drill Sergeant says, here to support you on X. Thanks, Old Drill. We got George says, Hunter Biden's art dealer got subpoenaed. Oh, yeah. Says, it's a money laundering uh, operation, says Steve Davis. Says, the agent from China or Ukraine wants a contract. And the funding says, Hunter does the painting for you. He'll paint a nice painting for you. And he'll also do some other things since his dad's the president, you know. Lightbright is here. Says, move all agencies out of D.C. Distribute them across the country. Only way to stop corruption it says let all chance all citizens have a chance to participate and george is sharing this one looks like some good polling numbers out of some of those battleground states look at that image of, of joe huh oh oh what's going on am i the president yeah and so let's take a look my friends you can of course follow us on the x platform at rob govea esq this is our profile and what we do here is we're up to 11 Woo! So these longer videos, these, like these are our segments. So these are the same segments that will pop up on the YouTubes. But we also should be starting to post our shorter segments as well. Yes, and we're also doing some time codes and also linking to our website now. So that's curious too. Yes, okay, cool. We're linking around. Okay, so here are like seven minute segments. So like this segment is from the morning stream. Okay, so you can tell because I'm not wearing a collared shirt. So if you, see, if you see one of these segments come out, that means that I, I, we recorded that during our members only stream, but we teased out a segment out of it. So uh, another 12 minute one, that's another one from the morning, right? So, so if you're not a Membo, you still get some of the Membo com content, we just record that stuff live. And that's kind of how you can tell what's going on. So we're really trying to also make it easy to spread the information around, trying to make the PDFs accessible on the website so you can download those and share those trying to SEO the website so that we can get reach from Google, right? Tr trying to build an informational infrastructure because we've got a lot of stuff to talk about in this next election. We're, we're, we're making some good progress. And so check us out. Also, you can join the Watching the Watchers community on the X platform. It's right here. And, and we're figuring out what to do here because it is, uh, I think, still under construction by Elon. As you can see, it's not even really loading up. <laughs> John McCarvey's over there. We got Nikki Haley. What? Uh, Ukraine? Yeah, yeah, that's right, Nikki. All right. So uh, that's our community. Come check it out. Watchingthewatchers.locals.com is another place to join us to become a Membo, which is where we record a lot of those, those streams. And so, my friends, that is it for us on the day. Thank you so much for the very extremely generous donos today. I very much appreciate them. And I'm grateful for them. We are going to wrap it up. Go over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com for our members only debrief. We'd love to see you there. YouTube members, grab the Telegram link in the community tab section on the channel homepage. We'll see you there. Don't forget to sign up for our daily newsletter. 
at robertgovea.com where you can get the daily show reports delivered to your inbox with links back to the website with PDFs. You can also get access to this mind map at robertgovea.com. So if you want to navigate around or check the archives or learn how to use the mind map to, so you can mind map your own stuff. If you sign up for the newsletter, I created about a seven minute mind map tutorial video to show you how to use it. And you can get access to that if you want to just check it out and see how it all works. So that my friends is it for us on the day. We are going to leave it there. I want to thank our mods and meme smiths who mod down the fort for us and keep things nice and orderly, including our friend V Antique Kiss Prime, who's clipping away for us today. Thank you, V. Along with K Bean in the house, we got Just Cause playing hooky. Our friend Ronnie Cole, we got Zulus here. Beyond Geo Stars, Zach Nichols, John Allen's in the house, Janik909, Dog Digger, and Donut Mind Me, all modding the fort down for us, along with K Bean and Zach Nichols on the day. We got our meme smiths, Jigum Gigum, Nathan N810, and Sleepy Dog Lee all memeing down the place and we're grateful for everybody who makes the show possible but that my friends is it for us tomorrow is a friday and we need to see you right back here so that together with your help we can shine that big beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding justice Make it a beautiful night, my friends. Sleep very well. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Bye-bye.